Hi everyone, this is Eagle News. I am EJ Gonzalez in Washington. It's Saturday, November 12, 2022, here in the nation's capital. This week's recap begins with the U.S. midterm elections. As ballot counting drags on, control of the U.S. Congress hangs in the balance. But with 211 seats so far, Republicans appear poised to secure a slim majority in the 435 seat House of Representatives. Control of the Senate may come down to an early December runoff in the southern state of Georgia. As of this broadcast, the Associated Press has the count at 48 seats taken by the Republicans and 46 seats by Democrats, while Reuters has the Senate seats even at 48. Either party could capture a Senate majority by sweeping Arizona and Nevada. 51 seats are needed for a majority. Now, the midterm elections have made several historic firsts with more than 100 million Americans participating. As the president notes, extraordinary results have been seen in these elections that no one thought possible. These include young people voting in historic numbers to continue addressing the climate crisis, gun violence, and even student debt relief. In California, Early midterm voters shared with our team what is most important to them this time. And why exercising the right to vote may help ease burdens communities are enduring across the country. Eva Basoyaje reports. Elections in Los Angeles are in full swing. We spoke with voters in Northridge, California about topics important to them and what changes they hope newly elected officials will bring to Los Angeles and to the nation. Nationally, what concerns me most is just that our democracy survives. January 6th was very concerning. There are a lot of people who believe that the 2020 election was stolen. That is very damaging to our trust in our, in our institutions, in our government. We need our government to function. Showing up, especially showing up this year to vote is just so important. The election deniers and uh, candidates that come out and are asked before the election, were you gonna abide by the results and they won't answer. I mean, these same people, if they talk to their own children, if they had the children had an election at school, I mean, I, I just can't imagine them saying, well, if you lose, don't admit that you've lost and just say that the election was rigged. And I mean, they probably wouldn't say that to their own kids. There's such a polarization in this country and we can't agree on what is true, what are the facts. And I'm hoping that some people will be elected who are willing to be honest and willing to address the issues and not only homeless, but there's some issues of corruption in city government, doing something, what we can about climate change. Just the feeling that people don't have much faith in their government and I'd like to see some people elected who maybe can help restore some of that. I voted in every election that I can. Even when we've traveled, we tried to get uh, absentee ballots and everything ahead of time. Very important for me that I vote in every single election. If you don't vote, then you can't complain. And the gap between mayoral candidates, as well as a number of propositions and measures, is too close to call. Which for most of the voters he spoke with, is all the more reason to make their voices heard. Eva Basayahe, Northridge, California, Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. And in related news, voters in the state of Nevada say the economy, education, and safety are among their top concerns when it comes to choosing their leaders. Anna Kui tells us more. Midterm election day in Las Vegas turned out to be rainy, cold, and windy, but it didn't stop people from coming out, waiting at least an hour in line at one of the polling locations before closing time. It was really good with the turnout, yes, especially when we saw the clouds and the rain and everything. We thought it was going to be a lot less people. According to one of the frontline election volunteers, today's turnout surprised her, and she was especially happy to see some first-time voters. Happy, <laughs> very, very happy. Well, we are happy and, and emotional. First-time voters who expressed their thoughts on the importance of having their voice heard. Sí, es muy importante hacer nuestro voto valer porque podemos hacer nuestra voz, los, las personas que estamos viviendo en los Estados Unidos, hacer saber lo que nos molesta y lo que no nos molesta. And just how prepared were these voters and did the campaign mailers that flooded their mailboxes along with TV and social media ads have any effect on their voting process? All the mailers, I 
don't feel good about it because it's too much trash. Yeah, the TV ads also is, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite annoying. Uh, it actually helped because we were able to just kind of see and prepare, so research as well. So we were able to not just listen to the campaigns that came out on social media and people knocking on our doors. And finally, I asked Jaime the top three issues most important to him during this election period. Making sure that we vote for the right people who have the best interest for, you know, Las Vegas, Nevada in general as well. We have kids, so economy, crime, education, so that, that was really something that we look into it and that was extremely important for us. Although the polls closed at 7 p.m. local time on Election Day, absentee ballots postmarked by November 8 will be counted as long as they are received by November 12. Anakui, Las Vegas, Nevada, Eagle News, we live in extraordinary times. Among the many historic outcomes of the midterm elections, the state of Maryland has elected its first black governor. Arlene Campo reports. Maryland makes the historic first in this midterm elections. The state has elected its first black governor, Democrat Wes Moore. In a sweeping win called by the Associated Press, Moore leads with 60% of votes, defeating Republican Dan Cox, who was endorsed by former U.S. President Donald Trump. Aside from being the state's first, Moore becomes the country's third black governor. Winning the state's top position adds to Moore's list of accomplishments. The 44-year-old is a combat veteran, best-selling author, and business owner. Moore says no matter your start in life, you deserve an equal opportunity to succeed, a job you can raise a family on, a future you can look forward to. Arlene Campo, Fort Washington, Maryland, Eagle News, we live in extraordinary times. More midterm news. Maryland's neighbor Washington, D.C. elects for the third term Muriel Bowser as mayor. We have Jeff Sanidad for the details. Muriel Bowser has been elected again as the mayor of the District of Columbia. This will be Bowser's third term serving the district as the mayor. We've all, I know that I did, uh, went through an interview process with DC residents, mine for nearly eight months this time, uh, and I learned a great deal. Uh, I heard of their challenges, their concerns, um, their best wishes, their big ideas. Uh, we were grateful to advance from the primary and even more grateful uh, that I have the opportunity to serve uh, for a third term uh, as mayor of the most dynamic city in the world. After her win, Bowser calls on district residents to submit what she calls big ideas for the next four years. Today, I want to uh, announce to everybody where they can go uh, to follow our transition, and that's going to be at together.dc.gov. And we're asking for anybody that has a big idea to submit that big idea. Uh, later in the month, we'll all get together for a summit uh, where we will discuss in person and through various means uh, how you can uh, submit those ideas and work with the leaders uh, who will help us get there. She encourages Washingtonians to be part of the district's combat and invites them to work at the D.C. government. Open positions can be found at together.dc.gov slash jobs. Bowser also announces that a diverse coalition made up of district government employees and leaders from outside the government, which will help her gather community feedbacks as part of her third term transition team. Jeff Sanidad, Washington, D.C., Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. Several extraordinary stories from Thomas Likeness today. From the cement industry that just might have to go if we want to reach zero emissions by 2030. To a baby factory in a Nigerian city. To thousands of people scammed with job offers in Cambodia. These and more on Correspondent at Large. And now news and commentary from around the globe. The concrete jungles we live in, are they now a threat 
to humanity. The cement that is used in construction worldwide produces 7% of global CO2 emissions. In fact, engineers say if the cement industry was a country, it would be the third largest emitter of carbon dioxide behind only China and the United States. As climate experts continue their annual meeting this week in Egypt, some say we have to go back to traditional building materials. Engineer Rupert Myers says the trouble with cement is the amount of heat needed to make it. Cement production is um, is polluting in terms of its CO2 emissions. They mainly come from the production of clinker, so the heating up of what's called the raw meal, so this mixture of limestone and clay, up to very high temperatures, so 1,450 degrees Celsius. So what are some of the alternatives? Stone, compressed earth, wood, even straw bales. But is there the appetite to make the switch? In Lagos, the capital of Nigeria, there's a maternity hospital with an unusual moniker. They call it the Baby Factory. That's the colloquial name given to this hospital. You see some 240 babies are born there each month. That's an average of eight a day. Nigeria is Africa's most populous country, and Lagos is projected to become the world's most populous city by the end of the century, with more than 88 million people. These numbers come as some express concern about the world's population today. It's reached the eight billion mark. Women in Afghanistan have more restrictions on their lives. The ruling Taliban government has now banned them from entering public parks and fun fairs in the capital city. This comes just months after ordering access to be segregated by gender. Afghan women have been increasingly limited in what they can do. They're banned from traveling without a male escort and must be clothed according to a strict dress code. Schools for teenage girls have been closed for more than a year. Women say they're bored, there, there are no schools, there's no work, and now, no fun. They say they're tired of staying at home. Amusement park owners aren't any happier. They say women used to bring their children for family gatherings. Now that that is not happening, business has ground to a halt. The lure of a promising job turned into a nightmare for thousands of people who responded to job offers in Cambodia. Once they arrive in Cambodia, they're kept captive, forced to work 12 to 16 hour shifts, operating online scams to line their captors' pockets. They scour social media and dating apps looking for victims. Anyone trying to escape was tortured and some even killed. The Cambodian government says it's cracking down on the operations, but international observers and rights groups, well, they say they're skeptical. A moonscape on Earth? Well, that's what the Spanish island of Lanzarote resembles. It's so realistic that that's where the European Space Agency is training future lunar visitors. Agency spokesman Francesco Suaro says the training starts with the basics. At the beginning, the astronaut just learns how to recognize different types of rocks, uh, uh, learns the basics of the geology uh, of the Moon, of Mars, on Earth. And then, uh, instead here, they are really uh, put in the field to experience the, expo the, the exploration of a terrain, which is something that uh, they will have to do on the Moon. And Suaro says the unfamiliar terrain teaches them to respond to unexpected situations. So they have to be ready to also change their plans and to be flexible and to uh, see things that uh, are unexpected because when you are exploring you never know exactly what you will find. I think I'll stay here with my feet firmly planted on earth. Back in seven days and in the meantime I wish you all peace, joy and happiness in the ensuing week. Thomas I. Leitner's correspondent at large, Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. Now with the U.S. facing an opioid abuse crisis, the country's top health agency announces an updated guideline for clinicians when prescribing the pain drug. Rossell Feria reports on this week's Health is Wealth. The 
Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, releases updated and expanded recommendations for clinicians providing pain care for adult outpatients with short and long-term pain. The 2022 Clinical Practice Guideline addresses determining whether to initiate opioids for pain, selecting opioids and determining opioid dosages, deciding duration of initial opioid prescription and conducting follow-up, and assessing risk and addressing potential harms of opioid use. The recommendations are voluntary and provide flexibility to clinicians and patients to support individualized patient-centered care. With millions of American lives affected by pain, the CDC says improving pain care and the lives of patients with pain is a public health imperative. The health agency says that during the pandemic, it has learned more from people living with pain, their caregivers, and their clinicians. CDC says it has improved and expanded recommendations by incorporating new data with a better understanding of people's lived experiences and the challenges they face when managing pain and pain care. Roselle Feria, Washington, D.C., Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. In other news, November 19 is World Toilet Day and in observance, the United Nations chief calls on world leaders to deliver on the basic human right to safe water and sanitation. Joanne Soriano reports. Days before World Toilet Day, UN Chief Antonio Guterres sends out a message to shine a light on the vital role of safe toilets in all aspects of sustainable development. The United Nations says over 700 children die from diseases caused by poor sanitation, hygiene and unsafe water. 3.6 billion people still suffer the indignity of living without a safe toilet. Guterres urges on World Toilet Day to focus on the impact of inadequate sanitation systems on groundwater, how they spread human waste into rivers, lakes and soil, polluting the water resources under people's feet. He says we are seriously off track to keep the promise of safe toilets for all by 2030. And this is a crucial indicator in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The UN chief says this issue has been neglected for too long as it happens out of sight, underground and amidst the poorest communities. He says safe toilets and sanitation improve nutrition, help manage scarce water resources, and promote school attendance and work opportunities. This particularly for women and girls. With every dollar invested in toilets and sanitation, fivefold is repaid in lower health care costs and increased productivity, education, and jobs. Guterres urges world leaders to act with urgency and ambition to deliver on the basic human right to water and sanitation for all people everywhere. World Toilet Day is observed on November 19th. Joanne Soriano, New York, New York, Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. In Ontario, after taking to the streets, education workers and transit workers are back to work as negotiations are underway. Here's Joshua Santillana on Learning Curve. Several major strikes happened in Ontario this past week. Workers of Gold Transit, one of Ontario's main public transportation systems, went on strike Monday. Meanwhile, education workers from the Canadian Union of Public Employees, CUPE, followed through on their promise to strike against the provincial government's strike ban. Gold Transit workers negotiated with Metrolinx, a crown agency of the Government of Ontario, addressing safety issues in the workplace. After a deal was not reached, 2,200 workers went on strike Monday morning. Gold Transit workers have since returned to work as the union continues its negotiations with Metrolinx. Cupe's long-standing and largely publicized debate with the Ford government ended this week after a successful strike. Premier of Ontario Doug Ford, along with Minister of Education Stephen Lecce, announced that they will repeal Bill 28 this Monday. The bill, which was passed quickly, made strikes illegal for education workers and used the notwithstanding clause to disregard the Human Rights Code. Nonetheless, education workers, along with thousands of allies, went on strike despite a $4,000 fine a day. Since the removal of Bill 28, education workers are back to work and CUPE continues its negotiations with the government for fairer wages. Joshua Santayana, Toronto, Ontario, Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. 
Now let's head back to New York where tens of thousands of runners, including some celebrities, take on the city that never sleeps. Joanne Soriano on EBC Sports International. The 2022 TCS New York City Marathon is back to pre-pandemic levels with 50,000 runners hitting the pavement to run through the five boroughs of New York City. Runners were greeted by cheers from the fans lining the streets during this miles-long party. The first to come through the course were the wheelchair division and elite runners. Sharon Loketi from Kenya took first place in the elite women category in her marathon debut. Daniel Dunashamento from Brazil took an early lead. Evans Chabet from Kenya then took first place in his New York marathon debut. Chabet also won the Boston Marathon in April of this year. Runners from all over the world arrived in New York to take on the marathon. Filipinos were present on and off the course. Miss Universe 2015 Pia Wurzbach was among the celebrities who joined the race. Spectators waited eagerly on the sidelines for family and friends. We asked some of them who they're cheering for today and what made them come out to show their support. We're here for my uh, cousins. They're here running as, as well as my friends. And why are you out here supporting Good them job. today? Oh, because of the cause. Um, I, I run the uh, marathon as well. And I'm more like uh, supporting like the active living, healthy lifestyle. And supporting today my brother and my sister. I want to support them so to add more energy and power for them. And I love them. A finisher shared his thoughts on his first run in New York City. Ah, uh, it's crazy. It's my first time here in New York. The crowd is so fantastic. You can feel the energy from the outside the road. And when you arrive at the finish line, it's so beautiful. Crazy. Whether you count it as 26.2 miles, 42.195 kilometers, or 55,000 steps, a marathon is a feat of the human spirit. Joanne Soriano, New York, New York. Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. From moving feet on the pavement, let's go to moves made on a board, chess. Chess Grandmaster Nigel Short visits Papua New Guinea to inspire enthusiasts to pick up the game. In Port Moresby, Echo Hortaleza Caniola reports on Oceania at a glance. English chess grandmaster and presently the director for chess development of International Chess Federation or FIDE, Nigel Short visits Port Moresby to promote chess development and chess programs in the country. Very welcome. In fact, you're very encouraged to Mr. Short calls the attention of Papua New Guineans to give attention to chess. He dreams of chess profiles raised into having national or international chess tournaments. A single event like this is to get attention, to get publicity, to raise the profile of the game in this country. It is a very beautiful game. It's a very cheap game. You just need some plastic pieces and a, a roll-up board like that, and off you go. I've, I've come here as the uh, FIDE, that's the International Chess Federation, Director for Chess Development. So my responsibility is for some of the smaller federations and hoping to improve things and to, to get things going in the, in the smaller federations. So I'm actually on a tour, a seven nation tour of Oceania and PNG is my, my first Stop. Yeah, well, I'm just uh, uh, hoping that uh, people will get involved, uh, that people, um, that there will be regular events. What I want to see is rated events, rated international events and national events. In fact, there has not been a national championship in PNG for 20 years, and that's not good. There should be every year there should be a national championship. FIDE chess candidate, chess master, Thomas McCoy, president of Papua New Guinea Chess Federation, 
encourages aspirant players to enlist in the upcoming chess tournaments. PNG Chess Federation is just, we're here to promote chess, get as many people playing chess actively and spread chess in the community. What we'd like to see is more regular tournaments and um, more participation. It's a free game, you know, so and there's a lot of fun that can be derived from playing chess. This is a kind of community sharing exercise where you're getting people together to play over the board and face one another. Nigel Short plays a simultaneous exhibition with 19 chess enthusiasts with different nationalities. While we're playing, uh, the, the excitement is really rushing in, uh, inside, of, uh, yeah, inside of my chess, <laughs> especially the first move. Yeah, but uh, eventually I able to control the feeling and uh, focus on the play. Uh, I feel very excited because it's you know it's a play with a grandmaster. It's very challenging and he's a great player. Well, yeah, a lot of challenges. He's probably one of the best in the world. Well, yeah. So playing against him is a really good opportunity. He's really polite and he's so so intelligent. I'm pretty sure he can close his eyes and visualize his next move like that. <laughs> a 13-year-old Filipino boy, Jorlon Quinola, the youngest among the players during the simul, manages to be the last three players defeated by Nigel Short. Echo Hortaleza Quinola, Port Morrisby, Papua New Guinea, Eagle News, we live in extraordinary times. As temperatures drop in the United States, vacationers tend to seek warmer climates. Places like the Bahamas, whose tourism economy suffered from the recent pandemic and also severe weather, are given a much needed boost. Jane Kathleen Gregorio speaks to residents in the city of Freeport as they share how life is like living and working in the Bahamas. Here's Adventure Awaits. Tourism has been at the heart of the economy for Bahamanian residents who rely on tourist dollars to keep their family income and businesses afloat. In recent years, however, hurricanes, as well as the pandemic, set many Bahamanians adrift financially. Our story today brings us to the city of Freeport, where locals share not only their struggles and their hopes and dreams, but also their favorite flavors of the islands. Freeport, Freeport is a beautiful place. The beaches is gorgeous. The city of Freeport, also known as the Magic City, it was known as the Magic City because this is where most of the tourists um, came back in the day. So if you come to Freeport, you can see more of a natural aspect of the Bahamian Islands rather than some of the other islands because we're not as commercialized as yet. We always go to the beach like whenever we get hot, we be like, oh, we're gonna jump in the water today. And me and like four of my cousins, we go to the beach. So life going up here is, is pretty good. Well, the economy is really bad. It's down. After the Hurricane Doran, mash up and if the houses, so many people died. From the pandemic and the hurricane, the last hurricane we had, it really damaged the island. So we was out of power for a couple of months and a lot of stuff got destroyed and a lot of business hasn't opened. A lot of people left the island. And you don't have no work. A lot of people wasn't getting paid and I'm just thankful that, you know, we get to see like at least two, three ships a week. It's better than just having nothing. This is Freeport Harbor. Uh, we were closed down for about two years due to COVID and we're now really getting back in the kick of everything. How has, the, uh, how has it been now that tourism is back in action? It's slowly getting back. It's not like where we want it to be, where it used to be before the pandemic, but we're slowly, gradually getting back. We normally used to use to work like five days a week. We're working one day, sometimes two days of the week. Slowly, I see it start to come back. The ships are coming back because we haven't had ships in a while. It was like it was like a relief, you know, that 
now we can, you know, try to make something, you know. If your family has a business or something, you can work for them. Well, for this economy, because it's such a small island, it's important for us to work together because all the money basically circulates throughout the entire island. So if we are making money, then we have to make sure that the other family makes money so that the money can circulate around the island. And if you come to Freeport and you taste you the, the food, you eat the conch salad, the conch fritters, you'll want to come back again. <laughs> First thing I'll tell them to try is conch salad. Why? I love it. <laughs> What's it made it's, of? it's conch out of the shell, and we just take it out of the water, they dive it up, and they pull the meat out, and it's very fresh. You can make it as a salad or they fry it. It's very tasty. It's good for the blood circulation. It's really nice. So the next thing we're gonna try is the famous conch salad. The conch salad. What can you say about the conch salad? The conch salad is the best in the Bahamas. It helps strengthen your back, give you more strength than you need. So you should try that, indeed. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna try the conch salad that Freeport Bahamas is famous for. I like it. And here goes. Mm. What do you think of it? It's good. Like real pineapple-y and lemony, but with a little bit of a kick. It's very, very good. Conch fritters here. They are so delicious. What's your impression of Freeport since the last time you came here? There was nothing back here. Last time I was here, all of these shops were closed. And I didn't think there was much at this port, but I'm enjoying it so much. Uh, there's so many shops and really good prices, very reasonable. The food is amazing. Thank you so much for joining us here in Freeport, Bahamas. Jean Kathleen Gregorio, Eagle News, Freeport, Bahamas. We live in extraordinary times. Now from the Bahamas, let's head over to SEMA 2022 in Las Vegas again. Experts of the electric vehicle industry share the basics of how to, as well as why, convert your automobile from gas-powered to electric. Red Manalo reports. Here at SEMA 2022, we see the latest advancements in EV technology, including new products and solutions for EV platforms and conversions. You can map out your build in the CAD software before you even start getting under the hood, throwing it up on your lift. Uh, you can use technology to help make that process a little streamlined. This year, the show added many new education sessions centered around the EV marketplace, where they have live demos and hands-on experience for volunteers. So I talked to a couple of industry experts about the basics of EV conversion. The solid prerequisites for building one of these yourself are you want to have some automotive background, like a shade tree mechanic will do, anything like that, and then you're comfortable with like lower voltage electronics. And then with that, we can provide you with our certified technician training program, and it'll walk you through all the fundamentals of learning these EV systems. And so our, our electronic self-paced education program that's online goes through five different modules. It starts with just EV overview, then it goes to um, EV systems fitment configuration, so you can figure out how these fit into cars, and then it goes into wiring, mounting, and then uh, testing, tuning, programming, and fault finding. I've seen all kinds of cars turned electric here at SEMA, even race cars. Uh, the car behind us here is the SCR1 that we've built. It, it's the first all-electric car that you can take racing in North America as an amateur. I'll be, I'll be honest, we've largely built this car based on our use case, which is, you know, we want to go racing. And I've spent far too much time lying underneath the car with oil dripping on my face. And I really want a car that just works and I want to go racing with. The performance characteristics of electric that torque right available at one RPM, it's gonna be great for coming off the corners. But of course, before one can enjoy that ride, there has to be challenges. You can really convert any car nowadays. Um, you just often have to get a little bit creative with how you're gonna make the motor mounts and the battery boxes to fit within the vehicle's footprint. So that's kind of the biggest challenge. And speaking of challenges, I wonder just how prepared will the next generation be for this new era of e-mobility? There's this talent pipeline challenge that the White House put on in June 
of this year and they invited a bunch of employers and associations and community colleges to make commitments to train people to be prepared for this next wave of e-mobility. There's definitely a lot to learn about this fast-growing industry of EVs including the U.S. infrastructure needed to support it and of course the many growth opportunities it offers for the aftermarket industry. Red Manalo from SEMA 2022 Las Vegas Convention Center, Eagle News, we live in extraordinary times. Now today we will share with you a preview of Plate Date's latest episode when Rex Dulai tries two of Seattle's coffeeholic bestsellers. The Vietnamese coffee topped with salted cheese foam and their ube latte. Coffee sounds really good right now. Take a look. Fall is the perfect time to really enjoy a cup of great coffee. Probably one of the best out there in my hometown, Yao's first Vietnamese inspired coffee shop, Coffee Holic House. Coffee Holic House is the first Vietnamese inspired coffee house in Seattle. They got their start in South Seattle in the hip, foodie friendly neighborhood of Columbia City. Even in the midst of the pandemic, they were able to thrive by community support and serving one of the best Vietnamese coffees out there in the city. Today, we'll be sampling some of their most popular caffeinated treats in their second and latest location, the cozy yet bustling North Seattle neighborhood of Greenwood. Uh, so first off, we're going to start off with the hot drinks. We got the most popular coffee hall of dream, the Vietnamese coffee with uh, a salted cheese foam. And this one is the uh, Purple Haze. It's a ube latte. Ube, purple, delicious. Reminds me of my culture in the Philippines. Let's start with the Purple Haze. All right. Ube flavoring has really strong in a good way, in a good way. Earthy, potatoey starchy but what's really cool about this is it's not too sweet which i really appreciate all right now this is the most popular drink it's the coffee holic dream it's vietnamese co coffee with a salted uh, foam on top how we're gonna conquer this all right here we go mm. i really like that blending of the salt and the coffee and you know the sweetness of it it matches Oh my gosh, so perfectly well. It's a wonderful blending. And what's this on top? Forgive me if I have foam on my mouth, but it's... When you have that saltiness and the sweetness, wonderful like merging of all these flavors, which I appreciate so much about the style of coffee. It's not just like bitter and that's it. Then you have to just dump sugar and cream. It's like having the bitterness, the sweetness, the saltiness all interplay with each other to form wonderful combination that just works exquisitely well. I think what I appreciate about Coffeeholic is that they embrace their Vietnamese heritage, but are willing to take culinary risks and push coffee to the next level. Rex Dulai, Seattle, Washington, Eagle News. Visit our YouTube channel Eagle News Live for full episodes of Plate Date. And before we let you go, here's our photo of the week from Mylene Cuscio. This is a view of the sun rising over Granada Hills in Southern California. The shot was taken atop Mission Point Trail. Thanks, Mylene, for getting up really early to get to the spot. Hope you enjoyed your hike. And thank you all for joining us again. If there are stories you want us to share with you, just comment below. View, like, share our other shows. City Limits with Alan Basalyahe. Connected with Dr. David. Take a seat and join us with Anna Kui. Plate Date with Mike Hudson and friends. Plus, Journey, Stories of Filipinos in Canada with Kathleen Cruz. Follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter at Eagle News Live. I am EJ Gonzalez. We live in extraordinary times. Happy weekend, everyone.